to yeah and uh, all right so welcome everyone good morning uh, it's my great great pleasure to welcome uh, professor Thiago Guerrero from the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro and yes yeah, so, uh, Thiago did his PhD in the University of Geneva under the supervision of Nicolas Gisa that's why I did my PhD as well that's how I knew Thiago and after his PhD, actually, kind of straight away after, he started the quantum optics or quantum physics group, let's say, in, uh, in Rio 2017. And since then, doing some really cool science. And so today he's going to tell us a bit about all of this. Diego, the floor is yours. OK, thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see the screen? OK. Um, so, guys, if you don't see my screen or anything goes wrong just shout and uh, i can uh, fix it okay and also if you want to ask questions uh, please feel free so let me see i can see my mouse okay so as Cyril was saying hi my name is Thiago. um today i want to tell you about uh, some of our recent developments uh, here in rio um but first okay i i don't think Many of you have heard of the university that I work in, so I, I'm going to make a little bit of advertisement uh, before I start the actual talk. So, uh, as I said, let me see, this is not working. Wait, I'm having problems. Okay, my computer froze. Just a second. Wait. I can see my mouse. Wait a second, guys. Just a second. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's fine. More people are joining, so it's best. OK. I think it's too heavy somehow. Wait a second. Okay, I'll try the PDF because the I've heard people had problems before with the with the Zoom and the and the keynote on Mac. Can you see the screen now? Okay, perfect. Let's see if this works. So okay, as I said, okay, this works. So as I said before, I'm gonna do some advertising. So yes, uh, I'm Tiago. Uh, as Cyril said, I did my PhD in the uh, University of Geneva with this guy here, Nicolas Gisan. And uh, after that, I moved to, to Rio, which is my birthplace, uh, to Pontificio Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. And uh, we started working here. I started, um, so wait a second. So yeah, this is, these are just some pictures of the campus so that uh, you guys can see uh, that it's nice. I mean, it's we're basically in the middle of the forest. We have uh, really interesting animals in the campus, uh, also people. It's really a great place to, to think. So if you guys ever come to, to Rio and you want to spend some time here, it's you're mostly welcome. Um, okay, perhaps the most important information is this, which we are like one kilometer away from uh, Ipanema Beach, uh, where you can do a lot of sports and uh, have fun. So yeah, this is this is uh, really nice. We have great weather all year long, and I mean, it's, uh, it's it will be a pleasure if you any of you pass by Rio and want to visit here. Please let me know. So this is the group. Um, we are the quantum optics group, which as Cyril uh, mentioned, I started in 2017. I started basically alone, so there was uh, nobody, but you know. Little by little, uh, people started to join in. This is a group picture we took just yesterday. And um, some of these people are here. Uh, so if you want to chat with them, uh, they, they, I invited them to see the talk. Um, so today, I want to tell you about what we've been doing. Uh, I decided to make a more general presentation of the stuff that we are working on instead of focusing on one specific topic. So like this, I can, you know, give a broad idea of the things that we've been uh, working on. I've prepared a lot of slides, so it's okay if I don't get to the end. 
So please just ask me questions. I really prefer if, if people just, you know, stick to one thing. And if you want to understand anything better, just, just uh, let me know because it will be a lot of information. Okay, I'm aware of that. Uh, so I will tell you about uh, some developments in nonlinear optical tweezers and optomechanics, which is more of a, you know, standard research that I started doing here when I moved back to Rio. Then I will try to connect this uh, to some recent research I've been doing uh, on quantum signatures in nonlinear gravitational waves. I'm going to explain what that is. And I hope I will make the case that these two things are not very separate. I mean, if you're doing one, you can do the other. And finally, even a bit more of a stretch, I want to tell you about this uh, concept of a, of a quantum robot or a Q-bot, which is something that I, I made up during the pandemic year that I spent too many days at home <laughs> reading physics papers. So I decided, you know, just, just came up and I wrote the two papers now about it. And I would like to tell you about it as well. So when I moved here, I wanted to do quantum optomechanics and it was quite tough because there was a, I mean, basically we had an empty room. This lab is, uh, it belongs to a colleague of mine, actually, who is um, uh, also doing a quantum communication and other things in the engineering department. And he was very, very generous to welcome us there and uh, let us use one of his optical tables. So we cleaned it up and uh, we started to, to make experiments there. Um, and this was my, uh, is my former student, Bruno Mello, who now is at the uh, ETH Zurich. And when we started in his uh, master thesis, we decided, okay, we want to do uh, optomechanics eventually, but building optical tweezers seems like a, a good first step. You know, I had never built, my, my basic training was in uh, photons. So I, uh, parametric down conversion sources and entanglement with photons, you know, the kind of things that people do in Geneva. And uh, I wanted to go into optomechanics, never built a tweezer. So let's try to build our first, you know, water immersion optical tweezer. So that's the first thing that we did. This was 2018, beginning of 2019. It took a while to gather all the, the stuff. I mean, here you can see some photos of the setup. It's a, it's a basically the standard Gaussian optical tweezer setup. With the, I mean, you can even buy from Thor Labs, but we built every, every little part of it. I mean, we really started from scratch and, and you know, we worked our way into trapping the particles immersed in water. You can see here, um, um, you can see here a schematics of the setup. And one nice thing about it is, is that, you know, here in Brazil, we have some resources. It's, it's not really that bad, but it's not abundant resource. We have to come up with things, you know. And uh, at the time, we only had one um, position sensitive detector. So we, we started to implement these knife edge detectors here, which was nice because it uh, resulted in a small calibration paper that we managed to, you know, make the, calibrate the spring constant of the tweezer using this uh, knife edge detector. So it was, it was quite a, a, a nice experimental work to do. And uh, I mean, we can calibrate the power spectral density of the tweezer and get the corner frequency and it's linear with the power and everything and we get reasonable values, and that's okay. So this was our first, you know, venture into optical tweezers experimentally. And then the pandemic came, you know, <laughs> which, was, uh, which was a shame. But at the same time, we were also thinking what else could we do in terms of uh, optical tweezers and trapping uh, of uh, particles with light. And it turns out that you can do a lot of things um, with light, you know, that you can do amazing tricks. Uh, and there are a lot of groups here in Rio that work on uh, quantum stuff. And one of the groups led by Antonio Zelaketch he works with uh, structured light. So we were talking about it, you know, let's collaborate and make something. So we decided to investigate uh, tweezers with structured light. And there was this um, classic paper by the, by the group of Miles Padgett in which they proposed building an optical bottle beam, which is basically a superposition of uh, a Gaussian and a Laguerre Gauss modes. And you get destructive interference in the center and you have essentially a bottle of, of light. And if you get a particle for which the refractive index of the particle is actually smaller than the, reflect, than the refractive index of the medium, 
then the particle will be expelled from the light. It doesn't want to stay here. So this is a, it's a potential maxima for, for the particle. So if you manage to trap a particle here, the particle will uh, just get stuck on a dark focus. And uh, we thought, okay, maybe this is nice. You know, we're just playing around. Maybe we can trap living things and so on. So we started to make the, the theoretical model of this, you know, and we discovered that there was quite a lot of interesting physics to, to talk about. So for instance, um, you can discuss the dimensions of the, of the bottle beam. Uh, you can, you know, relate that to the numerical aperture of the optics. There's a very nice theory that comes out. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting. And the potential of the optical bottle beam is interesting because it follows this uh, fourth power here with the, with the radial coordinate. So this is actually a nonlinear, non-harmonic optical tweezer. You know? And um, this immediately brought the question, okay, we have nonlinear forces now, how do we calibrate it? So in our paper, we propose you know, the standard Stokes calibration that you pull the particle uh, and you calibrate it against the, the friction of the medium that the particle is immersed and so on. But I mean, we thought that we could do better than that. Maybe, you know, there's the, the standard calibration procedure for uh, linear optical tweezers. So you get the position uh, time series, then you make the autocorrelation. It's a, a decaying exponential function. Then you Fourier transform that, you get the power spectral density. And then from the fit of the power spectral density, you can get the corner frequency. But now if you have a nonlinear uh, force, this whole thing here doesn't work because nonlinear stochastic differential equations are complicated and you don't know how to you know, calculate explicitly the, the autocorrelation function so that you get the PSD, for example. So we were, you know, this is, I'm just telling you a story. So please let, feel free to ask questions. So I'm just telling you how the things one led to the other, you know, in a sort of natural way. So I wanted to, you know, come up with, a, with an analog, analogous way of calibrating my optical tweezer, my, my nonlinear optical tweezer, uh, analogous to what we do with standard, you know, harmonic tweezers. And um, I was looking for it and trying to calculate the PSD uh, that came out of that and it was complicated and so on. And one day I came up with, a, a, I came across a paper which was published in a, in a neuroscience journal about uh, stochastic differential equations. And it showed how you could use uh, the Feynman path integral to do perturbation theory um, in order to get corrections to the correlator functions of a random variable subject to a potential and to a random force. So we, we looked into that and it turns out that you can apply all that theory, uh, all that path integral theory to, to, to tweezers. So the basic setting is that you have a second order stochastic differential equation. You have a force here, which can be either a linear force or a nonlinear force. So it can be both. You can have like superposition of, of forces and a stochastic term. And you can define a sort of, uh, a sort of partition function and from that partition function, you can do perturbation theory completely analogous to quantum mechanics, but now it's just statistical fluctuations rather than, than uh, quantum fluctuations. And you can get corrected PSDs, you know, and we did that with uh, Bruno Soassun and, and Bruno Mello, uh, my students here. And it turned out to, to work quite nicely. So you can, for example, you can start with a, with a nonlinear force. You define this uh, partition function you calculate corrections to the autocorrelation. So this is what you would get just if you had this A term here, the, the linear tweezer. And if you have a nonlinear tweezer, you get uh, this, uh, this other term here. And then you can Fourier transform that and you can get different corrections to the, to the power spectral density. So maybe this is a way of, you know, if you have a structured light optical tweezer and if you want to calibrate the, the nonlinear spring constant, so to speak, then you can just, you have an algorithm, you know, you can write a program and you just, you know, run the program and it gives you like corrections to the PSD, which you can then apply a fit and hopefully get the, the nonlinear spring constant. So it's a kind of extension. I mean, this doesn't yet work for the bottle beam because the bottle beam is a pure quartic term. And there is, it, it cannot, this only works if this nonlinear term is small compared to the linear term, right? But it's a beginning, I mean, it's, it was quite a nice, uh, enjoyable work that we did here. 
Uh, one thing that may be interesting for experimentalists that we notice uh, is that usually these corrections here, you can show that they can be approximated at least to first order as a shift in the frequency, in the corner frequency. So maybe if you have a nonlinear tweezer and you don't know about it, you will think that it is linear and you will either underestimate or overestimate the spring constant. So maybe for the experimental guys that are working on structured light optical tweezers, this could be of value, you know? And in particular, you could also, you know, make a study, you can create a sort of nonlinearity witness. So you can make a test on your optical tweezer by increasing the pump power. Uh, and depending on the behavior of the corner frequency as a function of, of, of the power of the laser, you get this sort of characteristic curve which for a, for a standard tweezer, it's a, it's a straight line. Whereas if you have some nonlinearity, if you're sensitive enough, then you're gonna get some sort of nonlinearity on the corner frequency as a function of the, of the pump power. So it's, it's potentially interesting for experimentalists. Now we, we made some estimates on that um, regarding um, Gaussian tweezers because Gaussian tweezers are also not perfectly linear. They have corrections of high order and they are very small, okay, so it's, uh, it, that's nice because we don't have to worry too much about this if we're doing calibration of optical tweezers. But if you want to do structure light optical tweezers, if you want to play with the, with the state of the field that you are using, then necessarily you have to you know, come up with interesting calibration methods. So this is just to show, this is a nice picture of some experiments. We run experiments all the time. Sometimes they don't work because you know, we either have to buy some stuff that uh, we still, need to acquire or because we change our minds it's, it's quite free but these nonlinear tweezer experiments are currently under construction with uh, Felipe Almeida and Isabella Souza and um, we're also working towards uh, vacuum tweezers and, and cavity optomechanics which is I mean the original dream establishing a quantum optomechanics lab here in Rio we, we do what we can I mean we, we, we will you know thoroughly walk uh, in the direction of the goal that we want doesn't matter how long it takes. And hopefully, I mean, this is a general philosophy that I, I sort of had to learn by myself. Like you have a, a general goal, but you don't really know how to get there. You just work your way out and you try to find interesting, you know, little new things that you can do along the way, which allows you to make interesting science with it. And it's sort of like not very well explored by the mainstream groups that are working on that. So that's the general philosophy. That, uh, that we try to follow here. Uh, so, okay, this is, um, I should also mention uh, some theoretical works that we've done in, in quantum optomechanics with uh, Igor Brandão and Daniel Tambechnik. For example, we, we looked into coherent scattering of particles trapped in a cavity, but instead of just having one particle, like in, in the papers by the ETH and, and Vienna groups, you have a bunch of particles and you model that theoretically. You can study how the entanglement flows between all the particles. Um, so we've looked into that. And um, along the way, we also developed, uh, this is mainly Igor Brandão's work. He's very good at uh, computer uh, programming and uh, computational physics. So he developed this uh, QGIT uh, toolbox, which is a free toolbox for Gaussian quantum information that you can, you can just download it on GitHub. And it basically trivializes any calculation on, on Gaussian quantum information, continuous variable states that you, that you want to do. So uh, yeah, we're working on a, on a paper on that, but the toolbox is already available if you want to start using it. It's, we, we made it in a very similar way to Q-tip, which is widely used. So if you already know Q-tip, it will be very easy to, to learn how to use Q-git. Um, okay, so this uh, concludes the first part of my talk, the one on optical tweezers. Um, so the, the main message here that I want to, to, to get across is that if you tune the state of the field, you can produce different forces upon matter, you know? And I'm gonna use this sort of general idea throughout my talk that, you know, in physics, we have this kind of duality. Uh, you have the, the being nature of objects and you have the doing nature of objects. So what I call the being nature is states and for example, initial conditions, that's a, that's a being, right? It's something that you are, you have a state, you have initial conditions. And then 
things are dynamical. So there are doings in the universe. So there are forces and uh, things can evolve. And the way that things evolve depends on the states, right? So there's this sort of dual nature. So throughout the rest of the talk, this is just a little bit of a philosophical uh, approach that I want to, to introduce. So now I want to talk about the second part, which is something that I'm very, very excited about. And I think it's potentially very interesting. Uh, which is the quantum optics of gravitational waves. So the idea here is basically that we are in the age of uh, gravitational wave astronomy. And this is sort of comparable to the invention of the laser. You know, this is how I like to think about it. So LIGO, which is the detector of gravitational waves, is basically a quantum optomechanics experiment. So if you, if you think about it a little bit, you see that these two mirrors, they move. And they, they have to be very, very cooled down in the center of mass motion is influenced by the passing of this gravitational wave and so on. So there are strong analogies. I mean, the physics is essentially very, very related. You know, the gravitational wave physics with quantum optomechanics, is, they're very, very connected. So I asked this question uh, two years ago. So can gravitational waves in different quantum states produce measurable effects upon gravitational wave detected. So the idea here is the following. So imagine that gravity is quantum mechanics, okay? Um, if you have two objects that emit gravitational waves like this, they emit essentially a coherent state of a gravitational wave, but there could be other processes in the universe which generate gravitational waves in non-coherent states, in states which are, for example, thermal or squeezed or even the gravitational vacuum is a different state, right? Nothing's happening, it's a vacuum. So the idea is, what are the predictions if you assume this uh, effective field theory quantized version of gravity? What are the predictions um, that you can make about the interaction of a quantum mechanical gravitational wave detector with a quantum gravitational wave? So this is the basic idea. And this, is, uh, this was a little bit explored by uh, Freeman Dyson in, uh, in what is, I think, now a classic paper from 2014, where he, he considered the, the question, is a graviton detectable? So he wanted to prove that gravitons exist somewhat like people prove that photons exist at the beginning of, uh, of quantum optics. Right? So to prove that uh, a photon exists in quantum optics, we basically have to detect a photon. And... Um, we, 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 do, we can do like a, a G2 measurement where you just put your photon through a beam splitter and you look for a correlated clicks on the detector. And if the detectors never click, you can measure the statistics of the field. And um, Dyson, he, he basically said, okay, if we have a single graviton impinging on, on LIGO, how sensitive does LIGO has to be in order to, to measure a gravitational wave made up of only one graviton? So he concludes that this is impossible because basically would have to have a strain sensitivity. So he would have to measure a displacement, which is on the order of 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, which is the Planck length. So as experimentalists, you can laugh at that. No, it's, it's ridiculous. And moreover, he also shows that uh, you cannot do it even in principle because if you want to measure tinier and tinier distances, you have to put more and more energy into a finite volume of space time. And at some point you put so much energy that the whole thing collapses to a black hole and the information is you know, stuck there. So Dyson argues that it's impossible to, to prove the existence of gravitons with gravitational wave detectors. And therefore he questions whether it's necessary to quantize gravity or not. He says, look, there's this effect Nobody will ever even see it. So why do we want to talk about quantum gravity? But again, we are in the age of gravitational wave astronomy. And, and I like to think of this as the invention of the laser for, for in terms of gravitational waves. You know? Of course, we don't produce gravitational waves like we produce laser light. But the fact that we can detect it means that we can, you know, now we have access to coherent sources of gravitational waves. And in quantum optics, if you want to prove that the field is quantum mechanical, the electromagnetic field is quantum mechanical, you don't need to detect the gravity. You can make, for example, homodyne detection and you can look at the statistics of the field. And if the statistics of the field is non-coherent, for example, in a squeeze state, then you've proven that the field is, um, is uh, quantum mechanical. 
And LIGO basically works like a, like a homodyne detector. I'm going to show it to you. Okay, I'm not going to prove it. it. The proof is in the paper, but, uh, but it, it's essentially, you can look at it as a sort of homodyne detector for gravitational wave. So the basic intuition is that when the gravitational wave passes by, it will move these mirrors. So it will change the length of the cavity in the arms of the, of the interferometer. And this change in, in uh, length translates into a, a change in resonance frequency of the cavity. And the resonance frequency of the cavity depends on the amplitude of the gravitational wave, which is very small compared to one. This is a dimensionless number, which is very small. So basically, you have an optomechanical interaction where you couple the amplitude of the gravitational wave with the number of photons in your cavity, right? So when I understood this, I was quite thrilled because I said, okay, I know very little about uh, astrophysics, but I know a lot about quantum optics. So I can you know, start playing around and thinking about these ideas. And everything I know about quantum optics more or less sort of applies here. I just have to tune in the correct constants, you know, put in the right numbers in, in terms of uh, the gravitational field. So I abstracted, I made a model. I mean, basically LIGO, okay, it's, it's a microphone interferometer, but for me, LIGO is, is essentially a fabricator cavity. So, it's, you know, it's, look at it in a blurry way. It's just take one arm and it's much simpler. And it becomes optomechanics. So you can work a little bit on the general relativity side if you want. If you, there, there are papers uh, by Yang Bei Chen, uh, for example, from Caltech, that they derive the, the Hamiltonian description of a gravitational in, uh, wave interacting with the electromagnetic field in a cavity. So this is really nothing really special. I mean, you can start all the way from uh, Einstein's uh, theory, and you can arrive at this optomechanical interaction pretty well established now. And the interaction works like this. So you have basically the free electromagnetic field term. You have a, a free gravitational wave term, which you can you know, assume uh, discrete modes. Like you do in quantum optics, you can put the universe in a box. And now you have discrete modes. And uh, then you can take the volume of the box, go to infinity if you want, it doesn't matter. Uh, and the most important part is that you have a gravitational wave interaction. So the, the number of photons in the cavity interacts with gravitational wave uh, field, which is given by a sum of uh, graviton creation and annihilation operators. here. And this is basically the, the dispersive optomechanical interaction, which we know how to solve exactly. Like it's, it's pretty standard in optomechanics. So you can calculate the unitary evolution and you find that uh, basically the unitary evolution of a gravitational, a quantized gravitational wave interacting with, with the electromagnetic field, you, have, is, you can divide it into two terms. For a single mode gravitational wave, you have a term which is entangling or squeezing. So it, it's a sort of curved nonlinearity here on the electromagnetic field. And you have a term which looks like a phase operator on the electromagnetic field, but the phase operator depends on the amplitude of the gravitational wave. So you can use this uh, to calculate properties um, of, of the light field, uh, which is interacting with gravitational waves in different quantum states. For example, the vacuum or a squeeze state or a coherent or a squeeze coherent state and so on. So I did that. Uh, this was in 2019. It took a little bit to get the paper accepted because you know, discussing with uh, people and referees. And, uh, but after a while, you, 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 okay, you work a little bit, you can show. I, I was really excited because I said, okay, I'm gonna prove that the gravitational waves can entangle things. And then there's an argument by uh, Vladko Vedral and uh, Chiara Marleto from Oxford, which shows that um, if you have, um, if you can generate entanglement uh, out of gravitational interactions, then basically this proves that gravity is quantum mechanical. And I was really, really excited. I said, okay, I got it. I, I will prove that gravity is quantum mechanical. And then you, you, you work your way through the effect and you see that it's negligible. Like, <laughs> like it exists, it's there. If gravity is quantum mechanical, you will entangle matter with gravity, but it's, you will have to wait for the age of the universe in order to, it's, it's ridiculous. So Dyson was correct in this, in this point. But okay, I didn't give up, no. And 
you can do a, a few interesting things. Like for example, you can consider a gravitational wave in a coherent state. And this is just mathematics. You calculate the effect of the coherent state on the, um, on, on the electromagnetic field. And you see that the effect is to introduce a relative phase of the field. So the, the phase in the cavity changes and it changes proportional to the amplitude of the gravitational wave. And this oscillates with the frequency of the gravitational wave, which is exactly what LIGO sees. So it's, I mean, despite you couldn't yet prove the quantum mechanical nature of gravity with this, uh, with this uh, thought experiment, uh, at least you can reproduce the, the classical general relativity result using only a quantum mechanical calculation, which is really nice. Um, then you can work uh, squeeze states and so on. And one interesting thing is that now we can come up with the machinery of quantum optics uh, to, to talk about this. So in quantum optics, you know, if you have a coherent state, you have oscillations of the electric field as I'm plotting here, but you also have noise associated to the oscillations of the electric field. If you have squeeze states, the noise, is, the noise associated to the electric field sometimes is much larger than the, than the coherent one and sometimes much smaller and oscillates like that. So the inclusion of quantum mechanics on gravity now allows you to speak about noise uh, associated to quantum fluctuations of the gravitational field. And a little bit after I, I published the, my paper, these three guys here, which are quite well known, they came up with a, with a similar proposal. Of course, theirs is completely different from mine. So they use a different formalism. They use this uh, fine path integral formalism, but they calculate the quantum mechanical induced fluctuations um, on a gravitational wave detector when a gravitational wave in different quantum states uh, passes by. So they obtain exactly what you expect. So you oscillate according to the, to the frequency of the gravitational wave. But around those oscillations, you have a little bit of noise. And this noise is because the gravitational wave is made of gravitons. And these gravitons have fluctuating noise. In the case of, uh, of a coherent gravitational wave, it's the short noise of gravitons. In case of squeeze, the, the, it's short noise is exponentially enhanced and so on. So they calculate an effective quantum induced Langevin force on, on, the, on the masses of the gravitational wave detector. And there's a noise term and they can calculate the power spectral density of the noise term for various states, for example, uh, the vacuum or thermal state or a squeeze state. And this is quite cool. I mean, it's, it's now for the first time by thinking about gravitational waves as quantum optics, you can talk about uh, quantum fluctuations of the gravitational field, right? And they notice that for a squeeze state, this noise is enhanced. It has an exponential factor in the squeezing parameter. So this is gonna be important for what I'm gonna say next, which is our second paper on this. Um, just a, a, out of curiosity, I mean, this is strongly connected with the path integral methods that I was mentioning earlier. So it might look like a completely different thing. Like, I don't know, my, my PhD supervisor used to say, okay, you're, you're crazy. You go everywhere. You don't talk about only one thing, never. But in my mind, it's all related. You know? So it's, the way I see these things, they are, they are really connected. Um, and you can also estimate this noise that they, that they produce. For, for reasonable values, you put the, the values there. This is a plot that I did uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, some other people I'm gonna introduce just in a second, some friends of mine. Uh, we plotted the, um, the, the noise curve of gravitational wave detectors. And um, this is the prediction according to, to, to these guys here, uh, Parik Wilczek and uh, Sahariad. So you see, I mean, it, it's nice. They predict that the gravitational wave detectors have sort of this intrinsic noise, but for any realistic value, it's really, really way, way, way below the, the sensitivity of even future detectors, which is this green and, and purple lines here. So there's not much hope that as we stand, we can see this quantum gravitational noise. So I, I was discussing with a couple of friends, uh, Francesco Coradeschi and uh, Enrico Schioppa and Antonia Frasino and Jennifer Rittenhouse West, the friends of mine who work on, um, on theoretical physics. Some of our, our experimental physicists in high energy people I met around the world. 
And uh, we said, okay, maybe wouldn't it be nice if we could have an effect associated to quantum fluctuations of gravitational waves? But if it could manifest, instead of manifesting as a, as a noise, if it could manifest as a signal. So we thought a little bit about this and we came up with this uh, new paper, which is, I want to advertise, it's on the archive now. So it's, it's a very cool uh, paper. We're very excited about it. So the idea is, if you consider a gravitational wave, which is in a squeezed coherent state, so it's a coherent gravitational wave, and you squeeze it, you apply the squeezing operator, then you can run the quantum optics gravitational wave machinery on this, and it will predict a phase on the interferometer, which is depending on the on the parameters of the squeezing operator. You can even you can either get an enhanced phase, so it's exponential, uh, sorry, a suppressed phase, so it's exponentially suppressed with respect to the, to the classical signal or exponentially enhanced. So this is, uh, okay, I was thinking a little bit about this and, okay, this is a, I mean, it, it depends on this parameter here uh, of the squeeze state. You get this curve here, sometimes you get enhancement, sometimes you get suppression, depending on the, on the phase. So this is quite uh, exciting because now if you have a gravitational wave, which comes from an event, which also emits other forms of radiation, like for example, light. And you, if you detect the light, you can know what you expect in, in terms of gravitational waves, according to classical theory. And then if your gravitational wave signal is either very small or very strong, then this could be an explanation. You know? So maybe, maybe, you could use this. It's maybe, 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 because there are many, many, many things. I mean, this is no real phenomenology. It's, it's, it's sort of a thought experiment. But in principle, it could be that there is a signature that you can measure, which would allow you to, to build evidence on the existence of gravitational waves in non-coherent states, in quantum states, which are not the same as the one predicted by the classical uh, general relativity ideas. So, okay, I want to rush through this because otherwise I won't get to the end. I mean, we also explore why should the gravitational waves uh, be in non-coherent states? And it turns out that there are strong analogies between uh, non-linear optics and, uh, and uh, gravitational waves propagating in curved space-time. Because Einstein's general relativity is a highly non-linear theory, you get nonlinearities for free and they are order one. So essentially you can show that um, if the gravitational wave propagates through a space time, which has a radius of curvature, which is comparable to the wavelength of the gravitational wave, then you could have a sort of parametric amplification of the gravitational waves. So you could have a coherent gravitational wave, which goes through a dynamical space time or which interacts with another uh, gravitational wave also in curved space time. And this will be like a, a parametrical amplification of the gravitational wave field, which will lead to squeezing. So it could be, and we argue that on the paper that you have events which produce a squeezing parameter, which has this uh, form here. I mean, this is all really nice because you can get the answers from dimensional analysis, but you can also like, once you know the answer, you can build a whole argument around it and, and come up with a, with a rational explanation. But we also argue on the paper that, you know, the squeezing parameter in some situations, like for example, a trio of black holes uh, interacting, maybe you could get a, a squeezing parameter, which depends on a, on a numerical factor, which is order one times the amplitude of the waves. And if the waves interact very close to each other, this uh, amplitude is very close to one. So when, when the waves are interacting, uh, say near the, 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 the curvature radius of a black hole and the black holes are running at the speed of light, which is what happens when the gravitational waves are produced, then this F here is order one. So it could be that you get a squeezing parameter which is non-negligible, you know? So we're very excited about this and there are like really uh, unlikely constellations between Newton's constant, which is what makes the whole thing be small. And here they cancel. So it's, uh, you know, maybe we will, uh, maybe we're open for discussion, but maybe this is a, a way towards quantum mechanics effects in, in gravitational waves. So I should say that this is a collaboration with, with these uh, 
friends of mine here, uh, Francesco, Jennifer, Antonia, and Rico. Some of them are probably here listening to us. I invited some of them in case there were a question. Um, and if you are more interested about this, just please feel free to, to ask or write me an email or any of these guys will be happy to talk about it. So I'm back to this slide now. So just to make a, a sort of like a common line throughout the talk. So tuning different states of the field produces different forces upon matter. So this is sort of being and doing duality in, in, in physical uh, objects. And here is, is the same, you know, you can think about if you change the state of a gravitational wave, what's the effect that it will have upon matter? You know? So it's, it's, it's strong analogies to optical forces. And, and you know, I, for me, they, they are all tangled up. Um, Cyril, do I have time? I don't know, 10, maybe 10 minutes. OK, please stop me any moment then, because I, I, I think I lost a little bit the hand of the number of things I wanted to say, but that's OK. No, you, you, have, you have yeah you have 10 minutes or something okay perfect so the, the the part three it's a little bit more detached from what i was saying but if you look at it from this uh, state uh, versus dynamics uh, duality that i've been trying to, to to talk about we can you know relate the two of them which is what i like to call qubots or quantum robots um so the idea here basically comes from the following. So in, in biology, you have these molecular machines and they are statistical uh, devices, the thermodynamical devices, which produce specific tasks, which have a function in biology. So for example, here we have uh, a, a, a machine, which is uh, the RNA polymerase, which takes DNA and produces RNA. Uh, we can have other things like uh, ATP synthase, which produces uh, ATP out of ADP and uses a concentration gradient uh, across the cell to, to function. Or you could have um, other molecules which concentrate, create this gradient of concentration. So, I mean, these things are commonplace in biology. You know? So I was thinking, everybody talks about quantum mechanics in biology, like quantum biology, quantum effects in biology and so on. But it would be nice to turn this table around and say, is biology, instead of asking, is quantum mechanics important in biology? I wanted to ask, is biology important in quantum mechanics? So can I take ideas from biology and you know, use them in, in some clever way to, to make things in uh, quantum mechanics? There's this very nice uh, paper by uh, Frauenfelder, which was very influential in all of this. I read it uh, two years ago, and it was stuck in the back of my mind for a while. Ask not what physics can do for biology, ask what biology can do for physics. So it's, uh, I definitely recommend it. It's a nice paper. So here's a sort of a definition of a, of a quantum robot or a qubot. Uh, it, it's a quantum molecular machine. Uh, a quantum molecular machine would be a device which is composed of at most a few thousand atoms, which is capable of autonomously storing, protecting, and processing quantum states in the presence of decoherence and thermalization. So it's, you can think about it as a sort of little molecular quantum computer, which decoherence and the environment will try to destroy the coherent properties of the, of the molecule. But somehow, just like living uh, machinery, the molecule manages to you know, go against decoherence and, and fix errors, but in an autonomous way. So you can think about it sort of like People are trying to build quantum computers. There's a strong effort along that direction, a lot of money from the industry, and it's all based on quantum error correction, which is something you have to do in order to have a quantum computer. And here is, it would be as if you are doing quantum error correction, but autonomously. So the, the whole system by its own dynamics performs self error correction, so to speak. So th this is sort of related to the idea of engineered environment, which is a big thing in, in quantum thermodynamics. I, I'm well aware of that. Uh, there's a lot of people that uh, discuss uh, this, and it's, 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 it's a very established concept. But qubots are a little bit different, because in these engineered environments, usually you know, the whole thing is, is an open system dynamics, which drives the system towards one specific state. Now, the, the qubot would be a little bit different because you would have an arbitrary quantum state, 
And no matter what, no matter what environment, no matter what happens, no matter what interacts with it, you will always stick to that state. So that would be an example of a, of a qubit. Or I don't know, he wants to perform a certain quantum mechanical task. And no matter what, no matter how decohering the environment is, how aggressive it is, you will always perform the task in, in, you know, in a faithful way. So it's a, a little bit different, although admittedly related, of course. Um, so I spent some time trying to come up with a, with a little example of this, and I came up with this uh, little device here. So let me try to walk you through this because it's, it's kind of crazy, but uh, it's, it, it's interesting. So you have here an atom, which is tweezed by, a, a, say, a, an optical tweezer, if you want. And here you have another atom, which can be in one of two positions. So either one of these two here. So the atom can be either here or here, okay? And uh, these atoms, they are stuck by optical forces. So here I show the optical tweezer here. There are other optical forces which keep the atom along this line here, but they are not shown. So it could be like a sort of tweezer with a long Rayleigh range. Um, and these atoms, they interact with a potential, which is a spin dependent force. Okay, so this is first just a toy model to, to, to give us an idea of how a qubot would work. So the basic idea is that these things here are in a quantum state, which is a superposition of either a psi minus bell state or a phi minus bell state. So if we call this uh, the logical zero and, and we call this the logical one and the logical qubit is an arbitrary superposition of these two states. And because of this potential here, the, 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 this atom will have equilibrium positions which depend on, on the state. So if it's in a psi minus state, the equilibrium point is here. And if it's in a phi minus state, the equilibrium point is here. So if you have an arbitrary logical qubit, it's in a superposition, the atom is in a superposition of these two, uh, posi these two points here, okay? And around these uh, two points, you have these sort of loops, which are a device which applies a unitary operation conditional on the position of the atom, okay? So if the atom goes here, for example, in this L2, it applies a, a X operator on the atom. And if the atom goes into this L1, okay, this L1 here is the same as this, it applies a Z operation on the atom, right? So what decoherence will do, what single qubit decoherence will do is that will, it will flip, it will either bit flip or phase flip the spin state of these atoms here. And when this happens, you will transform, for example, say we are in the psi minus state, which is here. It will transform, if you, have, if you get like a, an X error, you will go to a phi minus state. And this will change the potential interaction between these two atoms, which is given by these curves here. So if you are in the psi minus, this is the equilibrium position. And if you are on the phi minus, this is the equilibrium position. So when a quantum error happens, the potential energy changes and the thing is sort of forced into this L2 loop. But this L2 loop applies exactly the opposite operation. So it fixes the spin back to the original state, which goes back to this potential and falls back here. You see. And it, 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 I don't know if I'm making myself clear. I, I really hope I am. But it, it really is a miracle that this thing works in a way that almost any single qubit errors that you, that you can think about, it can correct almost any of them. There are two errors which they can correct. So for example, if there's a Z error or in A or B, either the atom A or atom B, then you can't correct it. And you can understand that because the number of dimensions in the Hilbert space is not big enough to support full error correction. But still, I mean, a whole bunch of errors you can correct. And uh, it's, it's quite nice because it's a little toy model of a system that no matter what happens, the, the environment will try to induce quantum jumps on the system and the system will, you know, by its own dynamic will counteract the quantum jump and put the thing back there. That, this sounds really a lot like a quantum version of a, of a little molecular machine. And, you know, it's, it's, it's I was really, really happy when, when I wrote this down. It's, it was fun. So, okay, this is just a toy model. I mean, I'm not gonna go into the details because my, I'm running out of time, but you can use um, some work by the group of Peter Zoller. Uh, this guy, Gladsley here is the first author 
where they showed it with Rydberg uh, atoms, you know, laser dressed uh, Rydberg atoms, you can get this sort of XYZ uh, interactions uh, between uh, effective spins. And uh, basically, I show in, in, in this recent paper that I published in Physical Review X Quantum that you can implement sort of not the full qubot, but you can implement sort of a prototype which is able to correct errors, any errors on, on a singlet state, for example. So you could have like these two atoms entangled here and the, the, the environment would try to destroy the, the coherence, but the, the thing would, you know, fix itself. And it's all based on these Rydberg dressed atoms, which is real physics. So in principle, you know, it, it could be experimentally built. Okay, uh, probably not here in Brazil. I have no expertise with uh, Rydberg uh, atoms, but if anyone listening here is a Rydberg atom person and is interested in knowing more, maybe to, to talk, talk about possible experiments, I'm currently looking for uh, some collaborators to, to actually build uh, a cubot. Um, yeah, with the Rydberg atoms, you can show that you have strongly spin dependent forces, which you can create, uh, which is also nice because it's sort of related to the structured light optical tweezers, right? Because here, the, the optical forces, they are not dependent. I mean, the, 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 the tweezer field, it's, it's a standard the optical tweezer, say, but the optical forces depend on the internal states of the particles. So it's also this. Uh, it's 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 also a very interesting uh, thing that, uh, of course, these are single atom tweezers. It's not mesoscopic. It's microscopic, but but still, it's uh, spin dependent forces which we can uh, think about. So okay, qubots are both being and doing. So they are both states and action. They are a system which carries a state and performs action to maintain that state. So they are real little agents, you know, it's, it's like a little thing which has a function and it just wants to do it its way. It's a sort of a quantum Maxwell uh, demon, if you like. It, it, it has agency, it just wants to, you know, protect the state and that's what he will do. Um, we can use the idea of qubots to, to maybe look into uh, active quantum matter, which is, you know, Active matter is a big field and soft matter is a big field that people are doing statistical mechanics of uh, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics with active matter. Now we can add the, you know, the spicy word quantum to this and you can think about little active uh, systems which are quantum mechanical and that have emergent behavior. We're kind of looking into that now. So this is the, the, the three stories I wanted to tell you about. Um, sorry if I was a bit on a rush. It was too much information, I'm aware of that. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions. And if you want, we can maybe do some physics together. So thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Tiago. That was great. Um, ah, Gavin, you have a question? Uh, yeah, hey, a couple questions. Um, sure. On that last topic, on the robots, um, how do you do the operations on the qubits? Yeah, this is a, is a great question. So you mean, how do you implement these things here, right? These loops, you mean? Yes, yeah. So yeah, in the paper, I, I sort of discussed that that's, I mean, you could, you could do it in different ways. So this is, okay more of a theoretical thing, you no? Know, but you could have hybrid quantum systems where the, the atom or ion talks to say a superconducting uh, loop, or maybe the easiest thing to do, you could also have like additional atoms which are, which are trapped and the interaction between these atoms, you know, effectively for a while performs the X or Z operation. But the easiest thing to do, I think would be if you have cavities and the time of flight of the of the atom through the cavity it would you know induce a sort of rabi oscillations and for a certain time and this would you know effectively create a, either a z or x so this is the easiest thing but um, i'm sure that you can implement it in principle but in practice of course it's uh, much more uh, tricky you know if, if we want to do a, a trap a single atom tweezer experiment 
you have to start slow and you know. But these are the ideas. There, I think I discussed other examples. I don't remember right now. For sure. Okay, but but do you know like um, a kind of ratio of um, the um, decoherence time with respect to one of the uncorrected errors to the the time to perform one of the logical gates? Yeah. Um, so I didn't talk anything about this, but in the paper we also discuss um, because you have to be careful because the way we constructed this with these Rydberg atoms and so on, they are trapped in a harmonic uh, potential and the wave function is sort of delocalized. So what could happen is that there's a little tail of the wave function that goes into the, say this cavity here, and maybe even the corrective device will induce an error. Uh, this, this is possible, it's, it could happen. And there are like optimal distances that you have to place uh, the objects um, there is a there is a compromise between how fast the decoherence is and how far they are because if the decoherence is very fast but they are very far away then you will decohere too fast and you, you can't fix it. But there are like sets of parameters. We study we make a little analysis on a sort of you know experimentally inspired system with Rydberg atoms in which we simulate the behavior of the thing. We assume a decoherence dephasing model for for the for the spin system, and uh, you know we make a stochastic uh, wave function simulation of this, and uh, and I mean there there are like the range of parameters in which the qubot can actually work and so on. It's, uh, it's all numerically simulated. Okay, um, and just one other question uh, on on sure. the first part yeah. of your talk. Um, sure. So you had this the, this nice. Um, uh, sum of of modes which gave you a quartic potential. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, have you thought at all about trying to do um, universal bosonic simulations? For example, you might think to simulate phi to the four quantum field theory where you have um, uh, local harmonic potentials as well as local quartic potentials, and then the, the analog of beam splitter interactions using tunable um, changes in the, the um, locations of the centers of the traps, which would allow uh, trapped atoms to interact. I, I have never thought specifically about that. Um, we, we collaborate with uh, a statistical mechanics group here, and now and then I poke them and I say, hey, look guys, do you think there could be any quantum field theory effects that we could, you know, even, in, even classically, like even thermal effects of, you know, to escape a potential or something like that, something that we could, uh, you know, simulate or do. But, um, but no, I, I guess the answer is no, I, I've never thought about that. Also because the way I looked into this was really just, you know, for this, uh, sort of classical tweezers, water immersed uh, tweezers. So yeah, I'm sure you could maybe think about something like that, it would be nice. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thanks for the question. Do we have any other question in the audience? I know this uh, question part is uh, because I'm organizing the seminars here now uh, in, in Puki, and I always have to ask questions in the end because nobody wants to, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so you just have to pay attention no matter what. You have to pay attention to me. <laughs> but it's okay. It's, you can always send me emails afterwards if any question comes up. Uh, I know this was maybe too much information at once. Actually, I have a question, which is something I've been thinking about. So, so about detecting gravitational wave. I guess you thought about uh, how how could I do that in the lab? And um, yeah. So, so could you use a levitated particle or a trap particle to, to to measure those without without those like kilometer long? Um, heavy so. You, I think you can. Um, the guy to look for about this is uh, Andrew Geraci. You know this guy is, uh, 
He's in the USA. He has a paper from, I don't know, 2000 and something, 10 or 15, I don't remember, which talks about uh, using levitated particles in a cavity to, to detect gravitational waves. But the smaller the cavity is, the, it will be more sensitive to high frequency gravitational waves, um, which there's a lot of discussion. It's really like a jungle of, uh, of uh, you know, people propose phenomena and effects and new effects that would generate high frequency gravitational waves and associated to new physics and stuff like that. So in order to detect the gravitational waves that LIGO detects, uh, with sort of kilometer long uh, wavelengths uh, between the 101 kilohertz band, I think there's no way out of a huge detector, uh, unfortunately. Um, there was this idea of using uh, sort of resonant balls of, I don't know, metal or something. But um, I think it's kind of, the people are not, I don't know of any real experimental, like, efforts along the direction but yeah now and then i think it would be nice but if i think too much about detecting actual detection of gravitational waves i think i'm dreaming too high and then i just pull myself back to the ground you know <laughs> i mean i'm in brazil man <laughs> we just had 90 percent budget cut <laughs> so you know we have to 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 dream, but not too much. <laughs> but who knows? I mean, uh, who knows? Uh, thanks. We um, should go back to Geneva and propose it to, to Nicolas to, <laughs> to detect gravitational waves. Yeah, probably, uh, probably now it is it's calmer. But uh, just to, yeah. I don't know if you're if you're in a hurry to. We can discuss more. Um, yeah, we can. Sure, sure. I um, just. I, uh, I, Going to conclude the seminar. So thanks a lot, Thiago. Um, Thank you. Hesitate to contact him. He's super glad to answer questions and probably to collaborate as well. And yeah. see you at the next quantum seminar. Thank uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me. It was a real pleasure. I am going to stop the recording. <laughs>